Hello and welcome to the January 2021 online meeting of Sydney Skeptics in the Pub. My name is Richard Saunders from the Australian Skeptics and the Skeptic Zone podcast and I'm the chief investigator here at Australian Skeptics. I pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting tonight. I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now don't forget you can subscribe to our magazine The Skeptic this year celebrating 40 years of publication. In fact you can access most of the back issues for free at www.skeptics.com.au and I think I'm safe to say we're all very pleased to see the back of 2020 and it's hard to imagine a more crazy year than 2020 right? I was up uh, extremely early this morning working on the Skeptic Zone podcast where it's nice and quiet and I joined some friends to watch some of the goings on in Washington, just the boring procedure that we thought it would be and we were quite honestly horrified and shocked by what unfolded and I can tell you a lot of my American friends were beyond shocked, close to tears. We shall see what the next few weeks brings. But now, some more sanity, or more sane guests, shall I say, from the United States. Tonight's guest speaker is Kenny Biddle. Kenny is a science enthusiast who investigates claims of paranormal experiences, the equipment, including video that people use to search for strange things, and the evidence presented for ghosts, UFOs, and cryptids. He promotes science, critical thinking and skepticism through his blog, I am Kenny Biddle, and the YouTube channel. He frequently hosts workshops on how to deconstruct paranormal photography and solving mysteries at both science and paranormal themed events. He hosts the live Q&A podcast, The Skeptical Help Bar, which promotes open discussion between people of different beliefs. He writes the A Closer Look blog for uh, on skepticalinquirer.com and was recently elected fellow for the committee for skeptical inquiry csi tonight's presentation Stra uh, strategies for solving mysteries this will cover some of the various investigation strategies kenny uses when taking on paranormal claims cases that have been solved will be features to de featured to demonstrate exactly how these strategies help and please spare a thought for Kenny, where he is in the United States. It's 3 a.m. right now. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions of our guest, and you can do that via the link on the Twitch page you're watching now. That should take you to Slido. And if you haven't done so already, please click the follow button so that you will be notified whenever we go live here at Australian Skeptics. But now, please join me in welcoming Kenny Biddle. Hey. All right. I guess I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, I guess, yeah. All right. So this is my presentation. I'll uh, get right into a little bit about myself. Um, I mean, I got an awesome bio by Richard there. That was beautiful. Um, but a little bit of background on me, uh, in addition to that, is that I used to be a ghost hunter. Uh, many, many years ago, I was a ghost hunter. I was one of those people that you see on TV and pretty much did the same crap that they did uh, until I discovered Skeptical Inquirer magazine. 
which was an awesome uh, thing for me because it really was my gateway into skepticism. Uh, my background is an EMT, emergency medical technician. I worked on an ambulance for a while. I was an auto mechanic. Uh, I worked in uh, aerospace, which was helicopters. And then uh, currently I'm an x-ray engineer with uh, most of the hospitals in the Philadelphia area. And so my entire career has been coming up to a problem, trying to figure it out, and then you know solving the issue. I've been a blogger since 2012. Uh, I speak at both skeptical and paranormal related uh, events. I maintain a good relationship with both sides. I'm totally a skeptic, love it, love science, uh, but I do hang out with a lot of paranormal friends, uh, psychics and ghost hunters and UFO hunters. We have a good time because honestly, they know how to drink and, and I love to drink with them. Uh, I almost, I'm also a columnist for uh, Skeptical Inquirer and uh, I did, I, I do podcasts and uh, yeah, uh, Richard covered the rest. So I'm going to jump into the next slide here. So this is a graphic that I did not too long ago and it's, it's basically some of the strategies that I use for solving mysteries. And most of the mysteries that I investigate have to do with ghosts, hauntings, UFOs, Bigfoot, cryptids, stuff like that. So all of these, and feel free to screen cap this if you want to and use it later. It doesn't cover all the strategies, but uh, it's, it's most of the ones that I use. And I'm going to go over a bunch of them today, today for the next like half hour, 20 minutes or so. So I'll jump right into it. One of the first ones is basically, who are they? <clears throat> you really not have to know who's making the claim. That's the big deal. Um, you want to know if they have an agenda. I mean, it, a lot of people are sincere. They're very sincere about whether they have an experience or not. You know, they had something happen and sometimes they're scared. Sometimes they're curious and they want to know more, which is great. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people that I've dealt with that have some other agenda and some of them are listed here. You know, they want internet fame, which, you know, I guess that's something cool. Uh, TV or movie deals, continued ratings, something to sell. Uh, I, I've come across a lot of people with ghost hunting gadgets that they want to sell and, and, they're making these wild claims that, you know, you can detect demons and ghosts and all kinds of stuff. And they want to sell you uh, pieces of equipment that cost like two or three hundred dollars, which honestly only cost like two or three dollars to make uh, increased tourism, speaking engagements. Uh, there's a lot that you can get into with uh, with people that are making claims. And one such fellow that I dealt with. Uh, a couple years ago was Mr. Roundtree here. And Mr. Roundtree was actually doing a, the circuit. He was actually uh, traveling the country. He was doing lectures. He was uh, getting gigs where he would speak at conferences and, and pretty much get the whole weekend paid for hotel meals, travel, all this stuff. And he did so on credentials. And you can see here, I think my cursor will come up on screen. I'm not sure. There it is. So Basically, uh, on his bios, and these are some of the bios that he had out there on business sites like LinkedIn and other social media platforms, that he was a physicist, um, that he's an engineer, that he's a paranormal researcher. And then on this other side here, one of his more popular bios, he was a captain. He claimed to be a captain in the United States Air Force, uh, also the mem member of the Special Forces that he was in Vietnam and he was at the fall of Saigon and the Mangas incident, two big uh, incidents that happened during the, that war. Uh, he also claimed to be an, a Native American shaman. And this is a photo that he had posted several times in uniform, in his captain's uniform with all of his medals. Well, I was, I, I had met him a few times and we were on a uh, podcast at one point where he was making these claims that he was a physicist. He had a PhD in quantum mechanics and a simple question. I asked him where from, and he refused to answer. He didn't want to tell me, which I found odd. I found that really odd. Like why, what's the big deal? So we started going back and forth and uh, he was getting upset with me. And the last thing he said was, if you want to know about me, Google me. So honestly, I, I Googled the shit out of him. Uh, I really did. I got together with a team and it was, 
it was there was about 10 or 12 of us that got together and really Googled him. And what we found out was that he did not have a PhD. Uh, we found out later that he he claimed to have gotten it from Princeton University. We called Princeton, found out he never attended, and then we found out he doesn't have a PhD at all. Then we started questioning other things because, like, if he lied about that, what else did he lie about? He said he was a Native American shaman, and he gave us a, a tribe that he was associated with. We contacted the tribe, found out he wasn't part of it. Then he changed it to another tribe. We contacted that one. And so on and so on until we found out that that was all crap. Uh, and for his military career, this actually really pissed us off the most is that um, he was in the service. He, he did enlist and he was enlisted for under six months. He was in January 31st of 1972 and he was discharged in June 19th of 1972. So just under six months. He never became an officer. He never actually went to Vietnam. Um, and and he was not at the fall of Saigon. He was not at the Megan Mangas incident. And actually, it's not listed on here, but he also claimed to have won the Silver Star and two Bronze Stars, which was also false. Um, his Pretty much his entire military career that he promoted himself on was false. Um, and we actually ended up filing uh, papers with New Jersey uh uh, Supreme Court um, for stolen valor against them. So this is one reason why you definitely should look into the people making the claims uh, because you never know what you're going to find. And we found that like his entire persona was falsified. And now he has pretty much fallen off the radar, moved to Florida, and we don't hear from him anymore, which is good for me. So another strategy that I go to is visiting the location. That's the second most important strategy that I, I think it, it, right after who the person is, if you can go to a location where an event or an experience took place, I highly recommend it because um, it's really important. Case in point, uh, this gentleman, um, his name is Tim Scullion. I actually heard of him uh through social media, there was a paranormal conference that was uh, probably about two hours away from me that was developing. And he was one of the speakers that was uh, was presenting. And he was presenting all these photographs, apparently, of all these ghosts that he was getting. He, he called himself the ghostographer because I guess he, he got so many ghosts on, on film that he just wanted to make up a name for himself. Anyway, uh, he put out this book called Haunted Historic Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, with the subtitle of Breakthrough Ghost Photography. And I ordered the book because I wanted to see what was going on. I got it off of eBay because I these kind of books I never buy brand new because I just don't want to support the authors. I'd rather just get it used. So I got this book, and while I'm waiting for it, I found his blog. And on his blog, there was a post here, and this is from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And it, Gettysburg is big deal with the Civil War, uh, and it's only about two and a half hour drive from me. So I'm looking at these pictures, and he claims to have been, let's see here, um, he claims to have been at a place called Little Round Top, which is basically a, a small mountain. And while he was on top of there, there was this, uh, he was taking pictures. He was taking pictures in the area. And he caught a white figure, as it says in the, the highlighted text here, that he picked up a white figure near the trees. And he took a second photo and um, it became it started turning blue. And you can see that on the on the images here. The, it started turning blue on the right side image. And he thought that meant that this was a Union soldier, uh, a part of the Civil War. When I saw these photos. I pretty sure I recognized him because I've been to Gettysburg probably 50, 60 times uh, because it's not far from me. It's a big, you know, paranormal spot and I, I like going out there. So I contacted a friend of mine who was a history professor that lived in Gettysburg at the time. And I sent him the photos and I said, you know, this guy's saying this is a ghost that's running around in the field. Um, so I talked to him. My, my friend went out to the location and he found it. 
he found what the ghost was and the ghost turns out to be a statue um <laughs> it, it's it's not only a statue but a very obvious statue uh if you look at the the photo the photos here the three that are uh comparing side by side only the one on the right is the one that we took uh the other two well no actually we took the 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 middle and the, the one on the, the right the one on the left is the original picture and for him to take that photograph he had to be standing exactly where uh this other photo on the on the right side of the screen was taken and my wife took this picture and you can see that me uh let's see i don't see oh there it is that's me and that's my buddy the history professor standing in front of the statue and you have to remember that this statue is actually out in the open it's not hidden it's not behind trees it's not obscured you can see it from pretty much all around the entire field uh, a few acres worth um it's not hidden so for me this was act this was solved within like 10 minutes because it's very obvious that it was a hoax um and he was really trying to uh, push it as a ghost so visiting location i mean that that really solved it because you can you can see it's it's matched up pretty good all right so another uh another strategy i use excuse me uh is that this is probably the most boring and tedious strategy that i ever use and it's reading the comments uh I know it sounds boring, but you get a lot of information from it. You get a lot of bullshit and arguing and, and nonsense, but once in a while, there's that little nugget that helps. And for this case, this was actually a conspiracy theory, uh, a movie conspiracy theory that popped up uh, on an episode of Scoring in the Strange with Ben Rafford, Celestia Ward, and uh, Pascal Romero. Uh, they were talking about movie myths, and the movie Home Alone came up which you know i love came out in 1990 great movie and this scene in particular there's a conspiracy theory that elvis presley showed up and they're saying that this gentleman in the background here is elvis presley and he snuck on to the, onto the set as an extra and was just part of it the funny thing is is that elvis died in 1977 so this movie came out 13 years after he died so um, somebody had contacted Ben Rafford and asked him about it and wanted him to solve it. And Ben's pretty much like trying to be nice, but saying, this is not my mystery. You know, I really don't want to look into it. This is an extra in a film from how long ago? 30 years ago. And, and I don't know if we can find it. I listened to the show. I was like, you know what? Let me take a crack at it. Let me see what I can figure out. So I did. I started reading the comments because the first thing I did was actually go to YouTube because I had never heard this conspiracy theory before that Elvis Presley was in this movie. So that's the first thing I did. I went to YouTube. I played a video that was explaining it all, you know, explaining it. And I came across a, 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 a quite a few comments and one popped up that said, yes, sorry, guys, this is my deceased husband, Gary Grodd. And she didn't want to ruin uh, their hopes. I guess they were all excited, you know, that it was Elvis. But this actually gave me a name, uh, Gary Grot. This gave me a name to start with. So I went to social media because almost everyone's on social media. And I actually found a guy named Gary Grot. Kind of looked like him from his profile picture. Uh, Gary was also deceased. Um, sadly, he had passed away in 2016 so i didn't get a chance to talk to him but his profile was open it was public so i started looking through the pictures and found this photograph which he's a little bit older and maybe a little bit more heftier in the in the the face there but when i put it side by side with the man from the the movie you know elvis presley it looks like a dead match to me um so up to this point, I think it was easy to say, like, this is probably him. And the case really is solved from uh, reading comments. But I wanted to go a little bit further. Even though I couldn't talk to Gary uh, anymore, I did notice another comment on his page 
uh, from his son, Roman, uh, talking about how his dad was great and selfless, selfless man. And, and so I reached out to his son. Uh, the very next day, Roman called me. We talked on the phone for like two or three hours. And I got to learn about his father, who sounded like a really good man. Uh, and I went a little bit further and said, you know, is there anything that you can you can show me like any documentation, any photos, any anything at all? He started by telling me that the the story of how his father got on the film and basically Christopher Columbus, who is the director of Home Alone, was driving through the town where uh, where Gary lived and passed by him on the street, literally stopped the limo. Christopher Columbus jumped out talk to him, introduce himself and said, Hey, you have a face that would look great in the background of some of my, my movies. So they were friends and, and that was it. He, Gary Grott actually appeared in a bunch of his films, but usually got edited out. Home Alone was the only one where he was actually in there for, for almost a minute. Um, so it was really cool. And it ended with um, Gary's son, Roman sending me, one piece of evidence, which is really cool. And this was it. This was a gift from the studio and Christopher Columbus. And it was a gift to Gary Grott for his participation in the film. And I want to note here that this picture of Gary actually doesn't appear in the film, this angle. Uh, he doesn't actually look directly into the camera during the film. This is from what's called a wardrobe continuity photo. And I actually talked to Pascal uh, Romero from Squaring the Strange, and he was telling me all about this, where when extras show up and they are on camera during the filming, like facing the camera, they take Polaroids in order to make sure that everything looks the same, you know, later on if they have to film a couple hours later. So they use this Polaroid film to make the poster. And this is actually a huge poster that's been on their wall since 1990. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. I um, mean, he does look like Elvis. Um, not, not exactly, but he does have a resemblance. So, I mean, I can see how people can make that mistake, but I thought it was a pretty cool, pretty cool story. Uh, the next, next, uh, strategy I have is about primary sources. And most of the time when I hear people say you go to the primary sources, it usually means people like go to the source who's making the claim, which I totally agree with. But it also can mean other things like official documents, newspaper articles, uh, books. And I use primary sources like this all the time. I don't just go by reprints and, and or if one book references another book, I track the, the references all the way back to the original source. And one of the cases that I used was uh, a, a ghost hunting show. There was a ghost hunting show released in America. I don't know if you guys have this one. It's called Ghost Loop. I don't know if you've seen it. It only lasted, I think, six episodes. It wasn't really good. It, honestly, it sucked. <laughs> uh, it was horrible. Um, but the first episode I was asked to review and, and actually write up a review. So I watched the show and... This is important. Uh, they go to this house in Houston, Texas, and the address is on the screen there. You can see it, 1509 Bonner Street. They go to this little house because the owner, who her name is Becky, she claimed that every night there was this shadowy figure that would start at the front door and like rush through the house to the bedroom. And it happened every night. And I mean, that's not even part of the, the whole investigation thing, but I wanted to make note that this was the claim that it happened every single night. Yet during the course of the show, not at any time did I actually set up a camera at night to see if it would actually happen. I don't know. Um, that's ghost hunters for you. But moving on, during the course of the show, they talk to a detective who is, let me see, this gentleman down here in the tie, uh, Detective Daryl Defee. And as they're standing outside the house, they're talking about a murder that happened there. And as the story goes, in 1921, this house apparently belonged to a woman named Emma Mia. And on December 23rd, her boyfriend, 
and it was like on on again off again kind of uh it sounds like it was an abusive relationship but her boyfriend at the time wiley thomas showed up at the house and he showed up drunk so he barged in he wanted to stay the night they had a fight and emma kicked him out said no get it you know get the hell out of the house a couple hours later he apparently came back and he barged in again lay down on the bed because there was only one bedroom lay down on the bed he took out a gun and laid it down on the bed and this got into another fight emma actually wrestled the gun away from him and then shot him once in the back of the head uh killed him she waited till the morning to call the cops <laughs> so i guess that's what they did in texas they're like oh, you know what let's just sleep on it for now and you know we'll get to it in the morning which they did they had a trial she was found uh innocent self-defense uh and that that's the story so i started digging and i went into some of the primary sources of the time which included the death certificate which you can see here and then i also went into the resident uh directories because I was curious at one point in the show, they actually revealed the address of the house, which is still up on screen. So according to the death certificate, um, Wiley was killed at an address of 2012 Lamar street, which doesn't match what we have here. Uh, and I went into the resident directories of the time, 1920s and found out that Emma Mia, her house, her address was actually 2020 Lamar Street. I went into his uh, address. Wiley was living with his sister at 2305 Preston. And this is also the resident directory that shows his address. When I looked at the maps at the time, um, this murder actually took place at a house four miles away from the house that was featured on the TV show. So by the primary sources, I found out that this whole murder thing never happened to this house. Nothing actually happened this, at this house. They just kind of stole this this event and made it look like it was at this house. So don't believe what you see on TV, which you guys already know that. We're all skeptics here. So moving on. <laughs> uh, attention to details. Another strategy that I use. Um, and this is just basic stuff. I mean usually I deal with photographs. I deal with videos a lot. Uh, I, I usually get sent five, six pictures a day, every day from ghost hunters, uh, UFO hunters from Bigfoot hunters. And some of the things you want to look at, don't just look at the picture, look at things like, um, what's around it. Like if they're pointing out, Hey, this is a ghost. Look at this ghost. Yeah, sure. Look at the ghost, but look at everything else. Look at lighting situation. Look at the uh, angle of shadows. Um, look at the background and the foreground. Look under the stairs. Look everywhere else because details are often hidden in plain sight and we don't always see them. Uh, what else do I do? Oh, I, I ask for what kind of uh, camera was used because that's important. Uh, different cameras have the flash on different sides, which can cause weird anomalies, depending on what you're looking for. Um, there's so much to to, to question. Um, and when you have questions, there's a lot of places you can research. And basically, these are some of the things that I use. Um, and, and we all know, you, you guys all probably know, you're not as private as you think you are. And that's the number one thing that I come across, especially when I do lectures for uh, uh, paranormal conferences and paranormal groups. Most people think if like they set their Facebook profile to private, that no one can see anything. That's not really true. Um, you, there's ways to get around it. Uh, but there's social media. There's uh, uh, Ancestry.com. There's a lot of sites there you, where you can get information on people. Google, Google Images. Um, Copyscape is one that I've used a lot. This is for checking for plagiarism. And uh, I did, there's a, a ghost hunter, a famous ghost hunter named Zach Baggins that last uh, a year ago, over a year ago, he published a book called Ghost Hunting for Dummies. <laughs> Don't even get me started on the title. Um, but 
I went through that and I actually used CopyScape for a little bit looking looking through the book and found out that pretty much the entire book was plagiarized from other authors. Uh, and that was something that I wrote about for Skeptical Inquirer. I actually got two articles out, that, out of that because there was so much plagiarism. Ridiculous enough. Uh, what else? There's uh, a netter online. That's for real estate. Uh, you can actually check uh, who owned a house or property, at least in the United States. I don't know if it, it works overseas. I haven't actually looked for anybody's residence overseas yet, but that allowed me to track not only the current owner, but previous owners going back 70, 80 years at least. Uh, and that's helped find locations for me. Um, what else? And Wayback Machine. I'm sure Susan Gerbeck has, has talked about the Wayback Machine a lot because I know she uses it. That's how I heard about it. But every time I see a website that makes a claim or post a, post a picture or a video and claims that they have a ghost or, you know, Bigfoot or something like that. I always archive it on the Wayback machine. And then I go check it periodically, but, uh, that's it. I'm, I know I, I talked a lot. I, I went through pretty fast. I hope it wasn't too fast for you guys. Um, but that is the end of my presentation. If you guys want to contact me for anything else, um, after this show or after, um, whenever, these are uh, my Facebook, my Twitter, all my stuff. So you can come check me out. So that's it. I am done. Woo. Well, I'm not surprised. It must be getting, oh, it must be almost dawn where you are. Now, if you look out the window, maybe you can see a new day. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, though. It's 3.30 on the dot. Woo. <laughs> that's not bad. We've had some interesting questions coming in during your talk, and I've got a few uh, I'll let me start with one of my own, if I may. You mentioned sure. the Wayback Machine, and I'll probably have to agree with you here. And one of the reasons I've been using Wayback over the last few years is I've been involved in um, putting together the world's latest, uh, largest database of psychic predictions. Now, this is going back 20 years, and we've got uh, in the vicinity of 4,000 predictions we're working wow. way through at the moment. And Wayback Machine is really interesting because sometimes I'll need to use that to go back in the history of a psychic's own web page to get the capture of a particular page where they're making predictions because I've discovered from time to time they'll go back and tweak their predictions right. to make them fit more more current events. Now, when you say you you archive, you categorize, you how do, how do you use Wayback exactly? I, I do exactly that. I mean, it's really simple. You can... Take a website. If you have a website, you copy the link, you go into the Wayback Machine, and right on the main page, it, there's a box that says to archive a web page. Um, put the link there and just hit save, or I think it says archive, mm -hmm. which I do that all the time because the same reason that you just said. Uh, there's been a, a, a few times, quite a few times, um, where I, I've had a, I've done it like a rookie error. Um, where, where I've written about something and I've gone back to check it later and found out that either after the article came out, um, or after I've questioned, questioned them, they've changed it. They've tweaked yeah. the website and they've taken out some things. Uh, there was a gentleman that was, um, he did a documentary. Well, it was a documentary. It was a pseudo documentary and there was one web page where he made a comment and revealed his actual name, his true name, because he was using a pseudonym. And I found it, and luckily I screen capped it. But when I went back to check after my article came out, it was gone. He deleted everything. Right. So, yeah. So I do that. As soon as I find like a gold nugget of information, I archive it right away. That's, that's, that's a good policy. And, and I do much the same sort of thing. Uh, and you, you say you use uh, magazine uh, newspaper archives, which is invaluable, absolutely invaluable. I've been right. discover discovering this too. And of course, as soon as I find something that hits the money, I will instantly screen capture it or copy it or print it or whatever the, you know, the, the best application is. Some of the questions pouring in, let's have a look now. Somebody <laughs> wants to know, in your opinion, a very technical question. It's, this comes from Steel Wolf. Uh, Ghostbusters or new Ghostbusters? <laughs> original 
I am the original. Uh, I'm totally for the OG um, <laughs> Ghostbusters. I don't like the new ones. And it, before anybody gets started, it's nothing to do with guys versus girls. It was the new ones sucked. That's it. The story sucked. <laughs> the details <laughs> sucked. There was no continuity. It was horrible. I'm I'm very much into the. I mean, I have I have some stuff you can see behind me. Like I have the Stay Puff. But uh, yeah, definitely old. All right, that answers old. that question. And if some people are having a bit of problem hearing me, I'll try to speak up a little bit. Somebody wants to know, and I can't quite see because you're on a very small screen. Uh, I'm looking. Is that Grogu there back somewhere behind you? I have Grogu. Yes, oh, I have one here. Oh, look at that, everybody. Uh, I have that one. <laughs> and then I also have I have a Lego one back here, too. Oh, heavens above. <laughs> there you go. I, th I think that the, uh, the the person who's putting this all together, Lara, our technical wizard, is just melting at the moment because I think she's <laughs> quite, quite taken with Grogu. Uh, another question is coming in asking, how do you finance all this work you do? Well, most of it is out of pocket, but I, I do, um, I work for, I, I freelance for Skeptical Inquirer. So I do get a little bit of income that comes from that. And that really just goes right back into what I'm doing. So if I have to buy like a ghost hunting gadget or something like that, because they're expensive, I usually get donations. I, I ask people, hey, you know, does anyone have this, this, gadget that they're not using anymore can i right. can i borrow it can i use it uh and, and most of it, it's funny because even though i'm diehard skeptic and, and most of the people that in the paranormal community that i interact with they know how i am they're still willing to help because the ones that i deal with they want to know more they're not just you know uh, i guess uh, i guess to be blunt they're not just dumb believers right they believe, but they want to understand more. So they offer help. Um, yeah. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not surprised. And uh, speaking personally, I do rely on um, subscriptions to the podcast. For example, people subscribe. And thankfully, some people some people do sort of keeps me going. Let's see another comment here. Uh, oh, yes, this one's quite interesting. Somebody's written that most ghost hunting shows look much the same. People running around with night vision, presumably night vision cameras and things. Usually one of the team is a psychic. Is this your experience with ghost uh, hunting shows? For the, well, the ghost hunting shows that I, I watch, and I mean, I, honestly, to full disclaimer, I only watch any of the shows if I do a review on them. Otherwise, I cannot stand watching them. Um, because the same reason they are cookie cutter shows, uh, they're basically have the same, somebody has to f freak out. Somebody has to be the tech guy. And then, uh, for psychics, I don't see a lot of TV shows, at least in the States here, not all of them have psychics on their team. Right. Uh, but I do see them bring them, bring a psychic in as like a special guest or, or something like that. Uh, but when I go out to conventions, Yes, there's usually a, a psychic on the team. It, it's like the tech guy, the leader, the case manager, the psychic. Yeah. So those are your, those are your uh, standard titles <laughs> that they give themselves. I, I've seen uh, at various paranormal um, exhibitions and conventions and things I've attended, well, before 2020 anyway, there will yeah. be a, uh, the, the ghost busting crew or the, the ghost crew or the ghost team. <laughs> And they all have matching black T-shirts. I want to see that. <laughs> one of my one of my rules, because I do show up at a lot of paranormal events. There's there's free ones, there's conferences, and then there's the I call them pay to play, where they like a historical uh, place will offer um, an investigation. You know, come out and investigate for like five or six hours, and it's fifty dollars or sixty dollars. And once in a while, I'll do it depending on like who's there. If, if there's a particular person that I want to get close to and talk to more, then I'll I'll put out the money. But my standard rule is that I will never, ever wear a black T-shirt at one of those events. <laughs> I usually wear something ridiculous like neon green or neon yellow <laughs> just so I stand out. <laughs> That's if I want to make a fuss. 
Um, sometimes I'm actually, I go incognito. I'll wear like a dark, okay. like a dark blue or something and just sit in the corner and watch. Um, I, yeah, I, and I love to do, um, mind, body, spirit festivals. When I say do visit, go see what's happening. And again, until 2020, I would go regularly every six months right. here in Sydney that they'd, they'd have one of these things. And I've been the guest of more than one paranormal convention as a guest speaker, which is quite uh, quite something. I found that absolutely fascinating. And, um, I, you know, if you ever get the opportunity to be a guest of the other side, so to speak, it, it's worth taking up. And my comment to the, a, a group of ghost hunters after viewing their running around at night, I said, why don't you do it in broad daylight so you don't trip over things? You know, what's... <laughs> <laughs> It's dangerous. Just turn on all the lights so you can see what you experience. I, I always try to point out, like, you guys are turning the lights out and then using equipment to see in the dark. <laughs> yeah, Why don't right. you just keep the lights on? <laughs> that's right. Ah, the, the classic answer, and you've probably heard this yourself, it doesn't work like that. No, no. You need the infrared light. <laughs> okay. Apparently so. Uh, somebody has a question here. Have you ever investigated something that you thought really might be paranormal? No. <laughs> and let me explain. Uh, I go into it thinking there's, there should be an explanation. There's got to be an explanation for it. And if I can't come up with an explanation, it just means that I can't come up with it. It doesn't mean that there's not an explanation or that it's it's automatically... Uh, paranormal and that's something i come across a lot and i'm sure you you've come across it where groups of people they if they can't solve the mystery within five minutes that means it's it's a ghost um right. or it's a demon or something like that no i um if i can figure it out and sometimes i can because i i don't know everything i i'm not an expert in, in every kind of science or discipline there is but if i don't know what it is then that's it. I, I stay there. I don't know. And, yeah. and some, some investigations have taken me like weeks or months or years before I I've been able to solve them. So I, I don't have any problem saying, I don't know. Yeah. And it's, of course you're right. And it's the correct answer many times, of course. I mean, you can't convince the diehard believer anyway, but as soon as you say, I, I don't know, then they take that as an admission that, oh, the skeptic doesn't know. It must be the ghost or it must be the UFO or it must be the creature or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Plenty of times when it's when when as soon as I say, well, I, I don't know what it could be. They're like, oh, so you're you're admitting it could be a ghost. That's right. Yeah. No, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I am not saying that. Um, but yeah, lots of times I've come across that. Have you? This is one I've had more than once. And uh, I've got, uh, it's been published by various people. Uh, psychics have this one, a stock one for the press, and the press tend to lap it up. And they say, well, what about the, the, the skeptics? And they say, oh, those skeptics, they once thought the earth, the earth was, was flat. <laughs> oh, oh uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here's another one. What's the most elusive mystery you've faced? Right now, the most elusive, because it's still ongoing, um, I have been searching for the final resting place of Rose Mackenberg. Um, and she was the she was Harry Houdini's assistant, uh, his wow. chief assistant investigator for psychics. Um, I, I don't know where she's buried. And I've been looking for her for several years. I've actually been working... Uh, off and on with Joe Nickel, um, trying to get more information. I, I have a copy of her death certificate. I was able to, I, I sent to the Department of Health in New York uh, a little over two years ago requesting it. And it actually came uh, about a month ago. And I've been in contact with the funeral home trying to find records because it's a mystery where she's buried. Hmm. It, it's actually funny. The death certificate has one place where she's buried and it's crossed out and another place is written in, but the cemetery that's written in doesn't exist. It's like it never existed. Wow. So yeah. So that's my elusive mystery. Cause I, I really want to find her because I, I think she's an incredible historical person. I mean, yeah. she, she did so much work and so much good work exposing so many psychics by going on undercover and 
she gets little credit. You know, she did a lot of work for Houdini and she gets very little credit for it. And I'd at least like to find her grave. I found her parents. I know where they're buried. I've been to their, their graves, but I can't find Rose. So I'm still working on it. I'm not giving up. Yeah. Well, and what a fascinating character Houdini was for many reasons. And, you know, if you had the, uh, the time machine, one of the times I think I'd like to go back to would be a demonstration given by Harry Houdini of a seance oh, yeah. where he'd ring the Absolutely. bells with his toes and all that sort of stuff. Wouldn't that be wonderful to see? That, that? would be so great. Oh, that would be, be really wonderful. good. We have a question coming in from Tim M. Now, that's a mystery. Tim for mystery. Tim, Hello, Tim M., whoever you are. <laughs> uh, survey by Richard Palmisano of Paranormal Investigators Practices. Most seem pretty sloppy and pre-committed to the paranormal explanation. What's your view? Can you? What's the first part of yeah. that again? Okay, there's a survey of paranormal investigators' practices. And okay. the comment is most seem sloppy and pre-committed to the paranormal explanation. Okay. All right. Yes, I, I agree. I totally agree. Uh, the majority of ghost hunters that I've, I've interacted with, they do the, they basically do what you see on TV. There, there's no science to it. It's pretty much uh, let's sit in the dark. Let's talk to the dark. Let's use these gadgets that light up and blink. And yeah. if they do light up or blink or, or make noise, then it's a ghost. That's it. Hands yes. down, it's a yes. ghost. Yes. There, there's no evaluation of what can happen. There's no controls over the environment. There is no, uh, for the most part, most of them don't even know how the equipment works, right. or how it operates, or much less how to interpret the results. So that's one of my big beefs with them. And, and I'm constantly pointing that out. Um, by simple questions of like, hey, how does that work? Can you explain that to me? And nine times out of 10, they're like, well, you know, you, you wave it around. And if there's a ghost, it blinks. <laughs> I, uh, no, <laughs> no. It's, it's, part, it's part of the show, though, isn't it? Ghost hunters were there seemingly scientifically advanced ghost detector equipment. Right. Yeah. yeah, their their methods are very sloppy, and, and that's that's being nice about it. Um, and I'm not trying. I mean, a lot of the people that I do interact with, they they mean well. They're they're believers, but they mean well, and they do want to learn more. But they've they have this tribal knowledge. That's basically what it comes down to. They've seen it on TV. They've seen other groups do the same thing. They go to a conference and they see. Uh, maybe like 50 to 100 tables set up and there's ghost hunting groups everywhere with all this equipment and none of them know what the hell they're doing with it, but they're all repeating the same crap. That's it. They're all rehashing the same thing over and over again. No one bothers to learn. And, and then you throw somebody like us into the mix and we freak them out because you start asking questions about simple questions. How does this work? Why does this does light this up? Work? Yeah. You know, can I make this light up with a two way radio? <laughs> if I walk over there and, and they're amazed when you do that, because I do that a lot. I carry a two way radio with me when I go to them and I'll, I'll turn it on and you see the little thing light up. I'm like, there you there's, go. There's a good tip. Another tip I would give uh, people listening to this or watching this is if you Google uh, Brian Dunning skeptoid, he did a whole episode on ghost hunting equipment. Yes. And that's uh, worth listening to. And I, well, yeah, I was, I was on that. I, I, I helped. I wasn't on the show, but I helped them with that um, because I also carry a radio frequency a RF detector because I have come across cases where someone has used a little remote control, a radio remote control to make something go off. Wow. And we've been able to detect it. So, yeah, folks, seriously, that's a great – and, oh, I'm, I'm very pleased to know that you contributed to that because I that's one of the episodes I listen to. I guess I would listen to that every few months because it just keeps those things fresh in my mind. And it's only 15 minutes, and it's very concise, and, and it's very worth listening to. Right. Well, that's – I think that's all the time we have for – it's way past your bedtime, <laughs> Kenny Biddle, I can tell. 
I'd like to thank you very much for being here at Sydney Skeptics in the Pub, and we hope when all this madness is over, although I shudder to think what 2021 is going to bring us, that uh, one day you can find your way on a plane and come over and give us a presentation in person. I would absolutely love to. I, 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 I've never been out of the country except for Canada. That doesn't really count though. <laughs> I, I literally went, to, my wife and I went up to the CFI offices in, in Buffalo, uh, New York, and then we went to Niagara Falls. So that's as far out of the country as I've been. And I would really, I'd love to come over and, and see you guys. Yeah. I mean, and there's lots of ghosts and mysteries and strange creatures to investigate yes. here in Australia. I can promise you that. All right. Well, once again, Kenny, thank you very much. And folks, thank you very much, uh, wherever you're watching us from around the world, for joining us at Sydney Skeptics in the Pub. Again, as I said before, if you, uh, if you haven't already done so, please click the follow button so you can see when we are going live again and get notifications. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you know the score. But for tonight, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia.